Welcome to our Mobile Revolutionary series, where we share stories, tips, and trends about all things mobile from industry thought leaders and practitioners. Today, we are exploring a topic support teams tend to overlook, quantifying the true cost of player support. We all know that having the right support experience leads to happy customers, but what are the right tools? What's the minimum investment required, and how does this translate into player loyalty? Furthermore, how do you position your support team as a key driver in customer acquisition and retention? We are very lucky today because here to answer these questions is player support veteran Peter Gerson, Senior Manager of Player Solutions of Keyword Studios. Keyword Studios is an international technical and creative services provider to the global video games industry, providing services such as art production, engineering, audio services, and more to 23 of the top five most prominent game companies. Welcome, Peter. Hey, Jackie, thanks very much. Great intro, I really feel welcome, thank you. And we also have a few interesting tidbits about Peter. He actually um, grew up in South Africa, but he right now is in uh, the Netherlands. He's a big cyclist, that's what brought him to the Netherlands. And uh, he's also a big cat lover. <laughs> Very true, very true, and both are very, very welcome here in the Netherlands. Well, Peter, do you want to get us through today's agenda? Yeah, so very, very, very welcome to join HelpShift on this opportunity and to talk about what I call the sweet spots of player support. And we really want to run through, you know, what does that mean? Why actually have player support? Why invest in it? And what do you mean by the sweet spot? Um, let's look at some hidden costs. Uh, they're often overlooked and people forget that if you, you know, if you don't manage these things carefully, you can easily overrun or get overwhelmed or your budget gets eaten up and, and you don't have the ability to deliver the services. Um, one of the reasons we work uh, closely with users around the automation and does automation really help? And, you know, are these bots, bots, bots coming? Are they going to take everybody's job? What's the reality around automation? Uh, and I'd like to just sort of share some case studies where, we found how to sort of find the sweet spot to balance and put these things together. Uh, and then summarize and see if the takeaways of what we promised we were gonna talk about today are actually delivered. So um, uh, I guess I'm gonna move on to what we call um, the main process. And, and if I had to say you, Jack, like, well, you know, why invest in player support? Uh, it would seem obvious to answer, you know, you've just got to give uh, uh, support. And we call it player support, but we're really talking about customer support here. Um, and you, I saw you wearing the, the awesome Harvard uh, <laughs> top. Uh, some of the best research comes out of the Harvard Business School. Uh, people like Gardner, people like Forrester, people like Forbes. And there's enough, uh, there's enough out there. If people just spend some time and go and look. Literally, that basically says to you that, a good investment in a customer experience, part of which is obviously customer support. It's where you get to hear your customer's voice and you get to interact and solve their problems. It's a really, really critical part. That whole process is um, uh, basically driven by how they experience that. And it's known that if you, you know, a bad experience can chase nearly 70% of your customers away. Um, people like to have self-help until they really want to be helped. And the, the real issue here is loyal customers. In other words, we say happy players are more, are more likely to spend more and be ambassadors for your brand and bring other people to the game. Because remember, we're game focused at, at keywords and we're working with um, Health Shift within the gaming environment. So we really want to talk about player support. They're five times more likely to purchase a game if they're happy and, and they're enjoying themselves then if, if that's not the case. So uh, enough really said about that. Let's really move to the crux. So if you decide to invest in passport, why would you? We've given you the case. There's ROR out there, and that's not what we really want to talk about. Really what we want to talk about is what is the sweet spot or how do you get it so that you get to put your money wisely. Lots of small to medium businesses or medium businesses are starting to scale often don't have the wherewithal to tackle these massive investments that are made by the very large industries into a player support setup. But it's not necessary to invest massive amounts. It's necessary to invest correctly. And also to be able to put a business case as the person in charge of support. Quite often in the small to medium and medium to scale environments, the people in charge of support grew up 
sort of inheriting this and having to learn on the job and having to grow. Maybe they're not part of the C-suite. It's usually the case they're not part of the C-suite. And they don't get to to have a, a, a seat at the table and talk about it like perhaps marketing or sales do. And so everybody's fighting for the budget of the company. And, and you've got to think about it. Like, should we invest in five more trucks to lo- to grow our distribution? Should we bring on two more sales reps to push sales? Should we invest more in marketing campaigns to get a, a, a wider reach? And no one's having a voice out there for customer support. You have to be able to put a business case. So let's look at the sweet spot. And really, if um, I put up a slide that basically puts, and in this case, it's players, but call them customers, right in the middle of what I call the golden triangle, you've really got to balance, you know, the experience they have, a great experience with cost efficiency and productivity to be able to justify having support if you're, if you're one of these companies that is starting to scale and certainly around the game. And it's and as I said, it's proven that if you do do this right, you get players to to be retained more. Support is definitely a retention strategy, and it actually costs two to two and a half times more, up to depending on the kind of company, seven times more. So between two and a half to seven times more to acquire a new customer than it is to retain and keep servicing an existing customer. And, and Peter, so would you say that this is something that's getting more focus from? from outside of just the customer support group, that this is something that now more executives are thinking through with respect to retention and acquisition? So it's a great question. And, and I'd love to say yes, and I think it is. But I think it's one of those areas that's still seen as a soft, nice to have marshmallowy thing rather than hard. And I think that what we're talking about now will, will show that it, it does have hard data behind it and it's proven that it will do its job. And so your question is correct. And I think that if times are great and there's lots of money around in a company, then this is something that easily gets done. But when times are tough, it's one of the first areas people sort of tighten up and lose sight of, hey, we need to be looking. So so the answer is a yes, but maybe. And and a lot of CX, there's a lot of talk about CX. It's sort of, I think, the new buzzword of, shall we call them, the twenties because we're nine took in, 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 and the new six, six, six is everywhere. That talks about the customer experience as a whole and support is part of that. And I think it's often overlooked. It's one of the most important pillars of CX and it's often overlooked by people spending more money on marketing or acquisition or stuff around the customer experience. So there's a ways to go still. And just very quickly drilling in, you've got to get this golden triangle in balance. And to do that, as the smart people say, if it, if you don't measure, you you can't improve. You know what gets gets managed gets measured, and if you're going to do the right job, you need to measure. And what are you looking to measure? And what does make up this golden triangle? Is things like how does your customer feel? Customer satisfaction, customer effort. How, how easy it is for them to reach out to you and get a result. Uh, we're all we're living now in the twenties. We have mobile. We have many channels. How many people still have to phone in? to get a problem resolved on a device that's connected and then still tell their story to three or four people as they get moved because it's technical, not billing. And it's, it still happens live today in these highly technical environments that it's a mission or a minefield to navigate. So how do you make it as easy as possible for the customer, call it effortless to get the right result with things like self-help, FAQs, automation, and then when they need help, someone there who's really knowing what they can do and help them and makes it as easy for them to get back to their life. That's all they want. Uh, and then again, you know, how do you measure productivity to get, how do you get someone being empathetic and looking after you and caring about you when they're under pressure to do X number of these a day and get through them and it doesn't become a burden to your agents. How do you create an environment that they can be efficient and productive and enjoy the job? And then the last thing of course is, you know, uh, how do you spend the money? If you're a small company that scales and you don't have a massive amount of money, how can you do this by leveraging uh, what's out there to create this this environment? So that's really where I talk about on the sweet spot. And um, what do people want most? When you look out there and you look at, at, at the research that's done, fast response times or getting things done really quickly and getting on with their life is what people want more. You often hear about give everyone a great experience and, and Look off them. I don't know if you uh, have an experience you, you can think about, Jacob. But it, it, most days, if you get, you're really happy with service. If immediately you reach out 
what you need is answered and you can get on with your life. You're actually yeah. really happy. You really just want a quick resolution. You don't, you don't, you don't need all the bells and whistles. You no. just need a quick resolution. And I think part of what CX gets wrong is that it's trying to drive this customer centricity is everything. And you've got to look after the customer and they should be able to talk to you on any. And again, if you're a medium sized setup with a limited budget, you can't have chat and phone and 24 seven and 19 different ways people can contact you and manage them with all the complexity that goes with that uh, and make it a great experience for them. So again, customers, if you, give an expectation, you give a promise, I will do this to help you, and that's how I help you, and you're very clear and you communicate that, that's all they expect, and then they know what to do, and they know how to, so if you can make it easy, so to reach me and get an answer, just do this, and I'll solve your problem, that's all they want, so actually you have this, as I said, this golden triangle, put another way in the slide that's on the screen now, it's quality versus done quickly versus low cost, that's the fight, and basically somewhere in the middle is where you get this balance. And really the cheapest you can make your support is to give the customer what they want, when they want it, as quickly as possible. Just when they want it, they want to get done. And there's another small little caveat. Everyone says they want to look after themselves and have self-help until they don't and they want to speak to a human. The problem is we never really know when that is. It could be right at the very beginning, someone gets irritated right at the end, somewhere in the middle, so you have to have the ability to offer them the self-help and then very quickly, no, I need to talk to a human now. I've had enough of this. That balance is also part of how do you manage the sweet spot? Because if you over-automate or you're only a technique or you only give them self-help, that's not a great experience either. When they do really want some help and they're not getting it through the self-help process, they get very irritated very quickly. So Peter, maybe you can tell us more about what, folks can do in their setup and what are some of the trade-offs they can make and how they manage that internally? Yeah. So what you need to think about in your setup is in fact, let's stay here for a second before we jump to the next, the next conversation piece, but it flows is um, actually listen to your customers. Um, think about what type of business you are in terms of the kind of game you are, your customers are trying to understand what would be the best way to service them. So, for example, if you're a, a mobile game with in-game purchases, um, microtransactions, as I like to call them, it makes no sense to have a setup that drives your customer away from that environment right. to their computer to go online to log a call through a form. You're effectively pushing your customers to the very thing you don't want, which is them yeah. to leave the game. Exactly. So what could you do to make it as easy as possible in game to get as much help as possible? And that is have, have self-help linked in game with frequently asked questions and a link through to a help device and, and modern technology allows it from the game. You can look up help and then go straight back to your game. It's something that's very, very easy to do on a lot of platforms, especially one like HelpShift. It's really, really straightforward. And that is the way that they would probably want to. But it's not always the case. Also have the option that there is a form because they may have had a problem, had to stop the game. They're busy with something else. They say, oh, I'd like to. And they happen to be in front of a computer now, not on the mobile. And they would like to just check and look something up maybe through a, a search have the ability to also sort of have that channel. But then again, beyond that, you don't really need to go. So I hope that in a, in a way that sort of clarifies what you're thinking of. Now to set these things up, are they complicated? They can be if you want to offer 24 seven, 17 different languages, five or six different channels, link in all your social media, track your store reviews, or you build the pieces at a time. And I think that that is the best approach by iterating. Keep talking to the customer and keep iterating. Look at where they're spending their time and then build your system out to be in the space where they're most. So if you have a game that's driven by a lot of community uh, on so, so social media or in channels like Discord and stuff, make sure that you can manage that with the platform you've got so they can easily reach you from those platforms. Uh, and that's just common sense. Uh, you're really looking to, as I said, create how can you keep this cost contained, your productivity up, and your ability to service 
by, uh, um, the, the actual customer satisfaction. It's just always thinking, what, you know, what works best to keep that golden triangle in balance. Uh, and, and I just wanted to point out that one of the key things people forget is, um, you know, you have options. You can outsource, you can insource, you can do it yourself. You can do no support and just offer, you know, some things do work that they, they we just don't provide support, work it out yourself, or they empower a community, they get volunteers. There's a number of ways you can approach this. You want to think about the, the game, the kind of players you've got, and, and, and what they would be looking for. And that's usually, again, by, again, games go through iteration. They don't just, lots of games go through test phases. Get some feedback in the test phase. Don't just test the game, the game plan and say, yeah, the guys are liking this. This is what we need to bring to market. Also test like, what would you think you would need if something went wrong? And there's one or two or three major simple questions you can put in there. Think logically, if I am a customer, what would I want uh, if I'm in a jet fighter game? where uh, I need to understand how to make, maybe use controls technically or, you know, will it work on certain, if it's a mobile, will it work on certain phones? You know, what's the minimum do I need? Uh, can I play for free forever? All these kinds of simple things. There, there, there's a ton of research out there that can be easily looked up on Google without you being an expert to maybe ask five or six key questions to your customers whenever you're running tests and get that feedback as well. It's often not done. You go to these beta tests and you go to soft launches and nobody's talking about what does the customer want or how would they like to interact with you if they have found that they have a problem. It's four or five simple questions. Like, you know, what's your preferred way of talking to us? Uh, do, you know, um, do you want to have support all the time? Uh, how long do you think is reasonable before support responds to you? Because sometimes you don't need to have 24 seven. You can work with seven days, have a decent, because people, as long as you build the expectation, you get the feedback and you set your system up and, and customers know that's what's going to happen. They're reasonable with that. And then you've got to think about, you know, what does it actually cost you to run these things beyond just, setting up the customer support, set up the platform you choose, training up, you know, the agents you choose, are you going to outsource, insource, uh, are you going to do languages? You've got to look at things like, how do I manage the setup? That's often where people lose sight of what, what I call the hidden costs. Um, right, I and you've you, mentioned that there's a, quite a few hidden costs and just thinking about things that might, folks might overlook, like time zones, cultural differences, that it might yeah. seem inexpensive, but but you have to really make those trade-offs. Yeah. So, I mean, an example, as you said, is uh, yeah. there's a cultural difference. It's English support. We're going to do English only. But our gamers are mostly going to be a North American based. And there's going to be a cultural difference if we outsource this to a destination like Manila, for example, who don't really know us. Well, it's firstly, it, that's a fallacy. Uh, they're really, really great at supporting games, that's what they've been set up for with the whole destination there. They're a support culture, if you like, and they speak really, really good English with very little accents, and they understand the gaming world really, really well. And so you can save quite a number of dollars per hour by doing that. And in outsourcing, you can manage, or you can near shore. So somewhere uh, south of North America, uh, there's opportunities to also, and they also understand this environment pretty well. So you say, but you know what, for cultural fits, I don't mind. I'm going to do it myself in office uh, or th through remote work now because of COVID. We're going to do it and manage this remotely ourselves. And we're going to hire North American people. And it's only a couple of dollars more per hour to hire them. Well, remembering that the quote you got from the outsourcer is inclusive. And now you're getting to hire people at a rate per hour. But then you still have to provide them an environment that they've got to log in. You've got to manage that. You've got to do your own reporting. You've got to set up all of your security around InfoSec and VoIP and avoidance and fraud. And then you've got to manage, if you do have it in office, you've got to have a cost of desk. And if it's out of office, you've got to pay for their cost of desk at home. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to work for, for peanuts. They do cost you a bit more if they have to have a proper gaming computer and the right hardware to be able to support your game, et cetera. Then you've got to put quality control systems in. Are, are people actually pitching up on their shift, doing what they're supposed to do? And you've got to, um, uh, you've got to actually check and quantify that that's actually happening. And then someone's going to manage this and spend some hours doing it. So these are all the hidden costs that are often missed when people just say, oh, an hourly rate to put someone in on support is X. That's just one aspect of it. You really have to look at the total cost 
of what it costs to put support together. And again, I come back to companies that are trying to scale from small to medium and, and get a game out there and compete need to really understand that environment because you can put very cost-effective support together if you combine your platforms and you think this process through. You can put out a much better level of player support than you think, but you really need to do the homework on that. And I guess that uh, could lead to sort of your question is, well, sort of, you know, how do you prove it? And maybe you have one or two other thoughts. But uh, my question is, you know, if I'd asked you, you know, what do you think about cu customer support? Would you have thought about some of these hidden costs? Absolutely not. I think there's some that we just take for granted. I think we just assume that it's all been sorted out and we forget that, you know, as you said, with each type of game, where the majority are players, like you said, the cultural aspects, these are things someone's going to have to manage. It won't go away just because you didn't think about it. Yeah. And, and if you don't properly put your business case to get your slice of that budget and they underfund you and then you can't deliver a genuine support setup, it's not great, right? Because, they, oh, look, we gave you the money and you still didn't deliver. What the hell? You, you really have to think these things through and cost them correctly. So even if you're not thinking of outsourcing and doing it yourself, which is absolutely fine, please make some time to talk to people who know what they're doing, pick their brains or get some consulting help so that you can set it up correctly. And then either way, you will still get a good result. Uh, and it kind of leads me to sort of like, where does automation play a role with this? And um, I don't, have you had any recent experience where you feel maybe you were talking to a bot rather than a human, but you weren't kind of sure? Or, you know, was it a seamless process when it stopped being a bot and became a human? Uh, does that ring a bell at all? Absolutely. I think, I think you know, it just depends on how, how the companies put it together. But sometimes you just feel like you're in an endless loop with the bot. And sometimes it's a pretty seamless situation. Where it's a nice handoff between the bot and the, uh, the agent. I think a lot of people sometimes don't even realize that they've just actually had a bot experience if it's done pretty well. <laughs> if it's done well. No, you're right. Yeah. And, and then there are times when it's pretty obvious. One of the things I always say is I think you need to be transparent and not treat your players or customers as, as fools and be honest about, hey, we, you know, we do believe in automation and you're talking to a bot and make it pretty obvious that it is one and that at an appropriate time, hey, this is beyond me, I'm a bot, I'm going to hand you over to a human. Then I don't think people mind as long as it's done and, you know, you're not, as you say, getting in this endless loop of them trying to give you something or send you to an article or whatever. It works. You say, did that solve your problem? No. Can I give you to a human? Don't try and I give them if files. It filters. Yeah, I think if it filters or channels you to the proper agent, that really helps. I think that's what I've found, at least with our customers. If you're actually able to guide the customer to the right agent, the one that has most of the expertise, it's actually a great experience. And it's also a great experience for the agents. People forget that there's humans on the other side of the desk. Exactly. They want to have interaction and be empathetic and actually add value to the people they're helping. And to do a repetitive task like, let me get your password for you, let me get your password for you, let me, that is something that's perfect for a bot. And people don't mind. They just want their password. They want to be able to do it easily. And as you know, that's one of the first areas that got any kind of automation. And similar types of tasks should be done that way so that you're not spending money wasting valuable resource like human intelligence on a repetitive tasks that you just get high tune and, and no loyalty or a really poor attitude from the agent, which filters through to the customer who doesn't have then a great customer experience. So um, people do prefer self-help, it's proven. But this bots are coming, bots are coming, bots are coming, they're gonna take all humans jobs away is balderdash and still we're 2020 by which time uh, all the, in 2015, it was predicted that 80% of all transactions would be done by a bot by now. And it's way off that. And he's going to continue to be way off that because it's not there yet. It will get there where more and more and more can be done around repetitive issues or more complex issues. But again, where you do need compl some complexity or human empathy or a touch and people prefer to ask for a human at that point of view. Even if a bot could do the job, that's where you have to have the mix. So what I've popped up here is, is some of the stuff you guys did in a previous report that's helping me compile the report I'm talking about. And it's to show you how initially when you deploy, it's more hands-on with your humans as you grow and iterate. If you're a small company trying to scale, you don't have to start with hundreds of people. 
you can start with a very small core focused team that knows what they're doing. And as you iterate and build the, the process out, instead of growing the team by adding lots of bodies to it, this is where you can start to say, well, if I pick a platform cleverly and I work with that platform intelligently, I can keep the cost down because every time a human touches a ticket, it costs money. But when a bot touches a ticket, yes, there's a cost to the platform initially. But over time, as that runs, it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so it's this fine mix of when bots should do things or automation should manage the process, when humans should manage the process, and when humans are assisted. And this is the part that excites me the most, to make the agents as efficient as possible and to really drive what I consider to be the next level of support is when you can get your agents to be assisted by the AI and the automation to be more efficient in being able to give the right answer. Because again, we're all humans. There's only so much we can retain. It's becoming more and more complex to sort of look after some of these issues. And the more we can build intelligent knowledge bases and AI that can assist the agent to do a better job and they feel more empowered, they will do a better job and make a much better customer experience. And so that's the black part of these graphs that we're showing. You can see over time that if you were just all manually driven, it would be a lot of this would be highly efficient and very expensive. If you're only automation driven, you get a lot of the repetitive stuff done, but you would fail horribly and you'd tickets would be repeated and repeated and repeated as you're failing to do the complex empathetic human touch stuff. But if you can get a balance between the two and then start assisting your agents, that's when the platform really starts to pay. And when we're smaller companies using the technology, then don't have to spend fortunes to be able to compete and really offer great player support. And so right, Peter, and I think that's what people, but go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I'm just rounding and saying, and that's that combination of the sweet spot we speak about. No, as I was saying, I think it's surprising for folks to look at the data that actually supports partially automating. But like you've mentioned before, it, you know, you can get a better seamless handoff. And not only that, you get better, uh, automation helps your agents. It helps actually the, the manual process. And I think that's what a lot of people miss, but our data just shows that this is, that it to be true, that you get, you get higher CSATs, you get improvement um, across the board with partial automation. Very good point. And, and again, what we're saying is it's not all or nothing. It's not all automation or all human. And somewhere there's sort of a handover. It's this integrated approach that, that automation and the platforms are able to deliver that if you take advantage of that, you will get a return. And it's built into most platforms, but most often overlooked again. It's one of those secret spots where people say, right, I'll take the basic package because I need some kind of automation. I'm not prepared to invest in the next level up. And then at your next iteration, you're adding more bodies instead of saying, well, let's think about, could we make the agent's life easier? Could we get more out of our platform? Yes, there's an investment. And I keep coming to back to this. What you're doing is making an investment in keeping your customers happy. It's a great retention strategy and it's going to give you um it's proven that if you look after these people, they're great ambassadors, they spend more, spend long in the game, they spend more in the game, and overall, you, you're getting a better result. It also means your process around the support as it iterates becomes better, becomes more efficient, and you do start to get the sweet spot or this golden triangle in balance. Um, I have some case studies, uh, and I'd like to quickly run through them. Uh, there's about two or three. Yes, that would be great. I was just about to ask you, can you show us some examples? I think that's what helps makes it tangible. Yeah. So, I mean, everything we've spoken to now is theory, in, the in theory, great. But reasonably speaking, and these are anonymized. Sorry that I have to do that, but these are anonymized. But really, you know, across all types of genres and usually across all types of hardware platforms, you can provide similar results depending on the type of game talked. And basically what really, sh what really shows here is you can see that um, ticket volume remained pretty steady. Replies remained pretty steady, except basically in quarter three, quarter four, they, they actually went down slightly. And the solved ratios stayed again pretty steady. But the CSAT went up and the number of agents that was required to do this went down. So the cost overall to the company investing in the platform came down 
a better result for customers and the same volume uh, of tickets was handled throughout. So it was slowly iterate and add, iterate and add, get the automation working, now it's working. You can, rem- you can go in, and this is basically real life over, over a whole year where we went from seven agents to three agents, did the same amount of volumes basically and received a better result of uh, an increase in CSAT of five points, which is massive. So um, that means that this company is spending less in quarter four for delivering a better quality support than they were in quarter one with less agents. Would you say that's what, uh, that jump in CSAT is, you know, something that other than with a massive change like this, you would be able to, to get? So you could have achieved this. If, if you look at what was happening where they were in quarter one, the choice was add more agents because we're not coping. Our CSAT's down. And you can see replies and resolved are, are, are not quite in line with new tickets. So your replies are basically, remember those stats we spoke about right in the beginning. This isn't a, I'm expecting people listening to have at least some fundamental understanding. And I'm not going to go into a massive explanation. But very mm-hmm. briefly, for every ticket that comes in, you'll have a higher than one. Otherwise, you're solving every ticket in one go. Your right. first contact resolution is 100%, and you're the br- most brilliant support in the world. Some tickets take more touches and take longer. Other tickets can be done in one go. So you can see here that there's a ratio of about 1. 1. 1.6 replies on average to a ticket. In other words, some tickets are taking more than two or three replies. Some are being done in one go. And as you go over time, um, as the volume goes steadily along, the ticket touches and the replies stay in line, but actually go down slightly. Overall, on average, they go down. So it means the agents are getting more efficient and your system is starting to cope where it's taking care of deflection or self-help, etc. So as your game grew, your ticket volume stayed steady. It didn't go up. Mm. And that what came in was better managed by less. So the normal process, if you didn't go automation, or you didn't put a good platform in here, would be that to make the same result of five points, you would need to have gone from seven agents to 10 or maybe 12 agents. Which is, in, at so the end, can also be expensive. Yeah. You would have had a great CSAT, but you would have added cost. Whereas here, you're keeping the CFO really happy because cost has come down and you're getting a better result. That's wonderful. Thank you for... Yeah, so then client B, basically, um, as they gained knowledge and expertise over time and tickets became faster and faster, and as a result of looking at the trends and seeing which were the repetitive tickets, which were the issues that could be handled by automation and self-help, and you could then prioritize tickets where there were difficulties to push those immediately through tagged through to agents more quickly and give them priority while the rest went through automation and self-help before because over time you get to see these ticket types, as they like to say, you can see that the cost per ticket over time, you can see the cost by solved ticket. So replies, comments, and cost. And what you want to see is your cost per ticket reducing. And it went from seven, seven euros, call it dollars, per, per resolve down to six. So that's a dollar per response cheaper which means if you then did uh, um, an extra, you could now do with the same team to spend the same money, an extra uh, about 15 to, 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 to 18% more tickets at no additional cost in the setup that's been created in this client, where they were specifically gearing themselves towards keeping uh, the cost contained. It slowly went down. So, and you can see overall, when you add all of the costs together, the total cost came down uh, close to 40% per ticket. So, so your that's incredible. That's, 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 a, that's a great change. Yeah, and, and your overall costs in terms of your replies and your comments came down. So you got more efficient agents, more stuff through self-help and the platform helping and there, there, there are for the same process that you started in quarter one, you're now getting a much cheaper result. Again, a CFO is very, very happy. 
And the last one, which was a shooter on multi uh, battle royale, which is things with monetization in app. Again, through working with this process, we got a trend upwards of CSAT. We got a trend upwards of first con uh, contact resolution. So more and more and more tickets were solved in the first go through automation, through self-help, and to having a better prepared agent and automating their work as well. So this is where um, it was automatically suggesting to them, this is the best answer, send this. And it was seconds to answer versus where it was minutes initially in putting that answer together as this improved. That's an so and, that's, and you see that on the, on the gamer side. You yeah. see that, the difference, that your questions used to take minutes to answer, and now they take seconds. I mean, you, yeah. you feel and, that and improvement. So you, 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 get a, a, you get a greater CSAT going again here by seven points up, and your first contact resolution, which is often a, when you go too high in first take contact resolution and too high in automation, we tend to see a, a quality process suffer. Well, not in the case if you do it correctly. So that, as we said right in the very beginning, what do people want? What do we want? We want to be our problem resolved as quickly as possible and we want to get back to the game. So if you raise up correctly the first contact, because you can also get first contact resolution raised by closing every ticket, by sending them an answer, but not being correct. Then you'll have very poor CSAT and people leaving the game in droves. But you've got 100% first contact resolution. So you've got to understand that don't just look at the metric, look at the result and look at it in conjunction. As I say, it is a golden triangle. You cannot just focus on one aspect of it. And this is proof that if you do it correctly and in conjunction with a good C a customer satisfaction and a good way of getting the problem resolved fast, overall, your satisfaction goes up and your productivity goes up. This is great. And I think this is a great example on that there are nuances, but you can see these benefits of automation uh, and just making sure that you equip your agents with the best technology and you're thoughtful about, I like to think of this, all of these examples as, you know, not being uh, a penny fool, you know, a penny rich, but a pound foolish, you know, you might have to make that initial investment, but you're clearly showing uh, that there are results yeah. to taking on that initial investment. These are customers in our setup where we are, we're talking on the help shift platform. So I took help shift data. You know, there are other platforms where we took help shift customers on help shift and ran what was the genuine. So, I mean, of course I can't publish this out there, but uh, if we really had to stand up to an audit hand over heart, I could show the real deal of these. And these numbers are real. They're not based on me making the process up. We went in and specifically said at random, let's pick three. We know customers have got quite high volume and we know we've been working with them for a while. Let's actually look at this. That was what triggered the report and me looking at, okay, this is definitely happening. What should we be putting out there to share these stats with people and build out the report? That's where the idea was born about what is actually the cost of player support and how do you put it together, even if you don't have a massive budget. And uh, thank you, Peter. And um, go ahead and lead us, lead us home. So, so I just want to know uh, if you feel in, in the conversation we've had, because obviously we will – uh, get some feedback, I guess, when we when we open this up later on to, to Q&A, that um, the promise was, hey, we're going to come up with a report that's going to kind of show you what these things cost and there's a sweet spot and think about these things. Um, is the true cost of player support balancing this quality, the productivity, and this cost efficiency? Does that make sense? And if that's an approach to take, you know, how did, you know, did we sort of put you on the path as a medium to large company that's trying to scale their support with limited resources, does it make sense to now start looking at how to put this together rather than, oh, we need to put some bums on seats, answer some questions and our problems are solved, but it's a cost situation to so do it as cheaply as possible and don't care about it. I think the two are very diametrically opposed. And if you're going to make the effort, then this is why you want to spend or invest in player support. You definitely convinced me, Peter. Well, that's good news. So uh, I guess... So yeah, so thank you so much. This is this is great. We're going to just, uh, I think for many of you, you probably, like me, uh, there were many insights that you'll want to double click on. And thankfully, um, you will have the full true cost of player support report available uh, for attendees uh, via, via email after the webinar. And we actually do have a little bit of time to open it up uh, to live questions. So if you have questions for Peter, please uh, send them over and, and we'll answer them shortly.
It'll be a pleasure. Thank you so much, Peter. We are excited to take your questions. I know we have a few already, uh, but please feel free to send us a, a chat and get your questions in. Peter, the first question I have for you is, if I wanted to sell the idea of automation to my management as a test to prove efficacy before scaling, what would be the easiest way to set that up and what type of investment roughly should I budget for? And follow up to that, is, is it possible to A-B test this? Oh, that's a tough one to start with because it's, it's a three-part question. Um, so firstly, yes, you can do a pilot and most platforms will work with you to do a pilot. Also, most platforms do have a free version that has usually most of the or all of the features in. And if you're working efficiently and quickly, you usually can get your test done within the free period, a month to quite often, if you've shown interest and you've worked the free period, I often find they'll extend that for a couple of weeks beyond as well. It's in their interest too, because if you're extending, you're showing interest, et cetera. So, so there, is, there are a number of ways of doing that. And the way you should look at it is really try and understand, you know, what you're trying to achieve. So set some clear defined outcomes for what the automation should show. Uh, for example, um, if we have automation doing some of the easier tickets and then the ability to pass over for more complex stuff, will it increase the first, cost, uh, first contact resolution? Will it um, leave CSAP the same or improve it? And will it get more efficiency? In other words, will more tickets come through the system even though less agent time is used? Because that's the real key. Think if 100 tickets come through and they're all agents, it's 100 touches by an agent, 100 the cost to you. If 100 tickets come through and 40 to 50 were done by automation and never even reached an agent, in time, that's a straight bottom line saving. So yes, to, to do that, that's what you do. You set up a pilot. Second thing is then scaling is pretty easy after that because if, you, if you're on the system of your choice, like, like you guys working with HelpShift, it's, it's pretty easy to set that up. Um, scaling out of that is just doing more of the same, taking your initial hypotheses, having proved it, that's the first part you roll out. Have it better down and then start adding as you go. Iterate, look at the next hypotheses, iterate. So yes, rolling out. And A-B testing, yes, because what was happening before was manual. So take what you did for, say, the last six months, and then over the test of the pilot, look at the average of the last six months versus what the pilot delivered. You can test it. While it's live as well, if you're clever, you can set up two buckets or two queues or two ways of routing your tickets. And so some still all go, the same issue, still, some will still go to a live agent. And you look at that performance and cost versus the same ticket type or same incident type, as, as we should call it for people who don't like the word ticket, the same incident type done through the platform, direct comparison to do the A-B testing. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I hope that answers the question. But yes, all three, all three are possible. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have here is that you, with respect to the different costs you've mentioned, which ones are the easiest to reduce or cut to prioritize speed of response? So, um, you know, we spoke about the hidden costs. And um, one of the ways is to really look at what would your needs be? Because if you're relatively small starting and then you may scale later, is to say, oh, what does it cost to have a small focused in-house team that I can work with to put the foundation in place, then later look as an option instead of doing it all yourself to find a good outfit uh, that you can work with an outsource partner, an outfit that fits you culture-wise. Because they, with economies of scale and the fact that they do this and have all that experience, that's one of the quickest ways you can ramp your costs down by using, um, as I said, a lower cost destinations. And also the fact that they can get you scaled and implemented and brought up to speed far quicker than you can do it. For example, it costs quite a lot of money to recruit. Not everyone you recruit stays, so you have quite a high churn. If that's not your problem but the problem of the provider, you've immediately lowered a cost right there. It's not always cheaper to outsource. People sometimes get that wrong. It's more cost efficient. There's a difference. 
because remember they also have cost of desk they're also a business that needs to make profit etc etc it's just that they're geared to provide that business to business service and it's not the core competency of most people who need to add it to what their core competency is which in this case is making beautiful games and delivering them to players so that is one of the key areas the second one of course is how can you more efficiently as you iterate how can you more efficiently do any process how can you more efficiently recruit so you know the profile you're looking for you know how where to look that's that's and again how can we efficiently adding a, a platform that makes it easy to onboard adding a standard way to train people so it makes it easier to onboard those are the areas you can really reduce the cost quite quickly wonderful thank you so much peter uh, let's see, I have another question here. A great way to show CX value to leadership is by attributing ambassadors and the passion of our player base to the support experience. How can we cleanly attribute it to our team versus it simply being viewed as dev creating sticky, addicting playing experience? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, we've got a great game. Players love us. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the support, right? <laughs> um, one of the ways, of course, is how you set up your player your player support and why we do say that at least put a good platform in that allows you to track and measure remember right at the beginning we said you know what gets measured gets managed and there's some key kpis you should be tracking to track your customer satisfaction and your customer effort score to track your productivity your touches your average handling time speed all of those if properly set up in a ticketing crm which is one of the things you guys do really well at Helpshift, is for that to be to be in place because the proof is in that data and you can report on it regularly and you can show, hey, this month we had um, uh, quite a lot of retention. These players have been playing for three months. Here are 20 of them that actually touched support. And look, they're spending more and spending more time in the game post because we got a high CSAT score. So you, you have to find ways to collect the data and measure your 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 way you are managing your support and then tie it into some of the results and that does mean you have to make friends with other departments to get information that's not always available to you but it is there and you can find it and the other way of course is using the voice of customer so um, ask them how are we doing what can we improve have you got any um, good stories to share with us? And in the community, using your community forums, as well as in the support structure, you have people who say, this was rubbish, I hate you, I'm leaving. But you'll also have players that say, great, great support, thanks, I love it. Sell, show those stories internally. Don't just keep them in the team. And raise up the people who were the, the ambassadors who handled that call or that ticket and got the person excited about the support they got, saying, hey, this this month, Carol Ann has been the superstar. She has 15 people raving about the support she's given. Here's the story. That's kind of, it's, it's, you know, there's nothing, they can't hide from it. It's black and white. No, I like that idea of making friends with the departments and being able to share data because at the end of the day, you know, retention is, is tricky, but it, it can be measured after attributing the impact of different initiatives to retention. That's where it gets difficult, but the more you have uh, sharing of ideas and data across the different uh, business units that are impacting it, I think that's, that's a great case. And to your point, you could just do a cohort analysis on those that touch support and the impact on CSAT, and then uh, was their retention higher? That's absolutely possible. Correct. And, and well, again, like the, case, the cases that I showed in, at the end of the process, Without some of the data from areas beyond just the the, the player support environment, we wouldn't have been able to show you, you know, um, what the actual costs were and how they came down versus what the performance of the agent team was. Well, I think that we'll we'll wrap it up there, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for for joining. The full two costs of player support will be available and sent out uh, via email to all those who registered. Again, thank you, Peter. This is wonderful. Great work at Keywords. I know I've learned a lot uh, through this experience, and uh, we wish you all a great rest of your day. Thank you for having me, and yeah, uh, hopefully everyone has a great day, and very soon has a great weekend.